Hey sweet friends, today we get to see what happens next to Runaway Ralph in chapter 3, which is titled, An Educational Toy. Ralph did not rest long. On your feet, mouse, said the gopher, appearing from the dark recesses of the gopher run. You can go now. Do I have to? pleaded Ralph, nervously eyeing the gopher's long curving teeth. I've come a long way and I need a day's sleep. Go on, beat it. The gopher stared at Ralph with his nearsighted eyes. This is my run and I don't want it cluttered up with mice. Please, Ralph tried to sound pitiful. I'm just a little mouse and I've had a long hard trip. I know you mice, answered the gopher. You are little and you look helpless, but when you move in, you take over. Then he added in a more kindly tone. Anyway, you had better get out while you can. That dog will eat his breakfast and go off on his round of inspection, and when he sees all the dirt he churned up, he'll start digging again. Maybe you're right, admitted Ralph, who was not eager to share a tunnel with a grouchy gopher. He pushed his motorcycle up toward the circle of light that was the entrance to the gopher run. There he paused until his eyes became accustomed to the sunlight. A stray chicken wandered across the lawn under the walnut trees. A horse whinnied from the barn, and from the dining hall came the laughter and chatter of boys and girls and the clatter of silverware. The place seemed safe enough at the moment. Ralph permitted himself a leisurely but bumpy ride along a path that led to a small weathered building shaded by an arbor of grapevines. At the corner of the building, he found a clump of bamboo, which offered the possibility of shelter. The fallen leaves and husks of the young bamboo shoots were broad and smooth, and the dried edges curled. He laid his motorcycle at the foot of the bamboo and pulled a husk over it. The edges curled around it so that it was hidden completely. He put his helmet under another husk, and too tired to scrounge for food, Ralph crawled under a third husk. Ah! Ralph curled himself into a cozy ball, the leaves beneath him were springy. The husk above him was smooth and silky and curled protectingly around him. Ralph had not been so comfortable for a long, long time. A delicious fragrance of hot cakes drifted from the dining hall, reminding Ralph of the dining room of the Mountain View Inn. The campers began to sing. The horses stand around, their feet are on the ground. Oh, who will wind the clock? while I'm away, away. Ralph wondered if Matt had wound the clock in the lobby. Perhaps Matt was searching for a broken motorcycle in the shrubbery at the foot of the steps of the Mountain View Inn. Well, he wouldn't find it. Now, all Ralph wanted was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Ralph slept more soundly than he had ever slept before. The next thing Ralph knew, a weight was pressing him into the bamboo leaves. He squirmed, but the weight pressed harder. He heard a cat's voice say, Now watch carefully. This is the way to handle a mouse. That greeting opened Ralph's eyes in a hurry. He saw to his horror that he was pinned to the leaves by the paw of a cold-hearted tomcat and was surrounded by a mother cat and a litter of wide-eyed kittens. Ralph simply closed his eyes again and tried to pretend he was not there. He could not believe what was happening. Cats were something that happened to other mice, not to Ralph. Now he wished he had listened when his mother had tried to warn him, as she so often did about cats, owls, people, traps, poison grain, and vacuum cleaners. Children, pay attention said the mother cat to her kittens. A live mouse is an interesting and instructive plaything. Ralph felt quite miserable enough without having to be educational as well. Now watch this, said the tomcat. The weight was removed from Ralph's body. A paw scooped him up and tossed him into the air. Nothing like this ever had happened to Ralph before. He landed on his feet and stood frozen with terror facing the cat. He waited with every muscle tense for the cat to pounce, but nothing happened. The cat, who wore an interested expression on his horrible furry face, simply sat and watched. 
Ralph was aware of the campers leaving the dining hall and scattering to different parts of the camp, but he dared not to look at them. If he watched his chance, he might be able to make a run for it. The cat, apparently distracted by a butterfly, glanced away. Ralph leaped for freedom, only to be brought to earth by a paw. That's the way to do it, said the tomcat. Mice are silly creatures who are easily fooled. Ralph lay limp and still, the cat's evil claws curling around his body. If Ralph moved even a hair's breadth, he would be stabbed in five places. Maybe if I play dead, they will go away, he thought. Children walked in and out of the screen door nearby, but no one came to the rescue of the small brown mouse behind the bamboo. He's trying to play dead, explained the tomcat, but I can feel his heart beating beneath my paw. Unfortunately, there was nothing Ralph could do about his heartbeat. If he ever got away from this cat, he would be a better mouse. He would listen when his mother warned him about cats, owls, people, traps, poised grain and vacuum cleaners. He would set a good example for his little brothers and sisters and cousins. Children forget that butterfly and watch closely, instructed the mother cat. This is the scoop and toss play, explained the tomcat. And the next thing Ralph knew, he had been scooped up by the cat's paw and tossed into the air. He managed to land on all fours in the bamboo leaves, but he was too terrified of that clawed paw to move. The attention of the kittens he was pleased to see had wandered. One rolled over and tried to catch his tail. Another scampered off after a leaf. A third trotted after a girl who picked him up and carried him away. The tomcat appeared to lose interest in Ralph and sat calmly, his tail curved around his feet, looking up at the leaves fluttering on the bamboo stalks. He thinks he's got me fooled, thought Ralph. If he moved, the cat was sure to pounce. If he did not move, the cat would pounce anyway. There was no way Ralph would win. He was doomed, doomed to be a mid-morning snack for a cat. Luckily, Ralph did not have to make a decision. There was a sudden whacking noise on the fallen leaves and a cloud of something light and soft settled over him. Then he found himself being tumbled about as he was lifted from the ground. Good for you, Garth, said a woman's voice. What kind of butterfly did you catch? It isn't a butterfly, answered the boy. It's a mouse. I rescued him from Katso. By now, Ralph had managed to get his feet down and his head up and could see that he was suspended in the air in some sort of net. Through the mesh, he could see a plump, cheerful woman who was wearing slacks and a blouse. He also could see the boy, the same boy who had clumped through the Mountain View Inn in new cowboy boots, who was now holding him so ignominiously in the butterfly net. Better a net than a paw, thought Ralph philosophically, because he felt that where there was a boy, there was hope. Boys liked mice. A mouse, exclaimed the woman. You caught a mouse in a butterfly net? Yes, answered the boy, and I'm going to keep him. Where, wondered Ralph, in his pocket? He hoped so. A boy's pocket was apt to be warm and dark and full of crumbs. The cat, cheated of his prey, stalked off with his tail in the air, trying to pretend in a most dignified manner that he did not want a mouse anyway. Good, said the woman enthusiastically, surprising Ralph. All the women he had known, the housekeeper, maids, and guests of the hotel, referred to mice as nasty creatures or pesky rodents, and from Ralph's point of view, spent their time trying to outwit perfectly harmless little animals. We can find a place for him in our nature corner, suggested the woman, who Ralph decided must be the Aunt Jill Sam had mentioned. 
Come on into the craft shop. I'm sure we have an old cage somewhere. Ralph was disappointed. He had looked forward to a dark and crummy pocket. At the same time, he was anxious. How could he get back to his motorcycle? The screen door creaked as if it was opened, and Ralph found himself looking through the net at a room with long work tables and walls lined with shelves full of boxes, jars, and odds and ends. Seated on a bench were three girls who were busy braiding with long, thin strips of colored plastic. They appeared to ignore the boy until the woman rummaged around on the shelves and produced a small wire cage with an exercise wheel inside and a bottle for water fastened at one end. Suddenly, the girls were interested. What's the cage for, Aunt Jill? asked one of them as all three jumped up from the bench. Garf caught a mouse in his butterfly net, explained Aunt Jill. He wants to keep it. In a butterfly net? The girls found this feat funny. Let me see, let me see, they begged. Ralph found himself being poked out of the net and into the cage. The door was closed behind him and fastened. He scurried behind the exercise wheel where he sat trembling, partly from fright and partly from relief at being safe from the cat. Isn't he a darling, cried the girls, their faces large and close to the cage bars. Isn't he sweet? Those teeny tiny ears. Look at those itsy bitsy paws. Ralph looked for help toward the boy, who had stepped aside and now stood scowling beside the screen door. Aunt Jill, can we feed the mouse? begged the girls. Please let us feed him. Ralph turned his back and curled up into the smallest possible ball. The mouse belongs to Garfield, said Aunt Jill. He gets to feed his own mouse. Skip it! Ralph thought Garf sounded angry. He heard the boy's footsteps leave the craft shop and the screen door screech and slam as it opened and closed. What's the matter with him? asked one of the girls, who sounded as if she did not really care. Girls, do you know what I think we should do? asked Aunt Jill. I think we should all help Garfield enjoy camp. This is his first time away from home and he doesn't know anyone here. I think he's lonely. But he's mean, protested the girl with a sunburned nose. He just stays off by himself. There's nothing mean about that, Aunt Jill pointed out. I know, admitted the girl, but he, oh, I don't know. Anyway, Garf is a funny name. Maybe he doesn't think so, said Aunt Jill. Ralph could feel one of the girls trying to poke her finger through the bars of his cage. At meals, he won't talk or sing, she said, jabbing Ralph with a stick. He just eats and then he gets up and walks out. Ralph tried to draw himself into a tighter ball. See, he's outside just standing there, said another girl. He practically never talks to anybody. Aunt Jill lifted Ralph's cage up onto a shelf in the corner near a window. Catching a mouse in a butterfly net is certainly doing something, she remarked. I think Garf should take care of the mouse. Ralph made up his mind not to budge. If he stayed perfectly still, sooner or later they would all go away and let him enjoy peace and quiet in his nice, safe cage. Then maybe Garf would come back. He might even think of bringing a corner of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Then Ralph would simply explain to Garf that he needed to get out of the cage because he had to take care of his motorcycle. He was quite sure that Garf could understand for he looked like the kind of boy who was interested in speed and motorcycles and who would know how to make a miniature motorcycle go. That's all for chapter three. See you next time.